The Montreal Canadiens snap a five-game winless streak. Carey Price gets the start and the win, and Dominic Ducharme gets his first win as head coach, but the goalie coach gets fired. Uh, I, I guess we'll try to break all that down on this week's edition of Hockey Inside Out. My name is Julian McKenzie, and joining me today, the usual suspects, of course, Montreal Gazette columnist Stu Cowan, Jessica Rusnak of CBC Daybreak Montreal, and former Montreal Canadiens defenseman and NHL assistant coach Rick Green. Thanks for coming in on this week's episode. Let's get right to these questions. The Montreal Canadiens win on Tuesday night, and you know what actually looked pretty good? Their special teams looked good. Their penalty kill was a perfect three for three, and they even killed off a double minor. That's 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 pretty good. And they also scored two power play goals. Uh, panelists, and I'll start with uh, the number one overall pick here, uh, Rick Green. Uh, what were your impressions of the Montreal Canadian special teams? Do you consider them fixed? Well, I mean, let's face it. Their their special teams have been talk, topic of conversation for a while now, and you know, looking at what happened uh, last night. I mean, obviously, their best penalty killing, for an example, is to stay out of the penalty box. With three penalties, yes, they did a good job. Yes, they killed them. Uh, obviously, a bonus. Um, on the other side, you know, the power play was was clicking. They were able to execute, and, uh, you know, they got the results from it. But uh, I still believe there's a lot of work that has to be done in fine-tuning some of those areas. Yes, they did they get the results, but... Uh, they have some work to do to uh, to make that uh, better each and every night. Yeah, the power play looked much better against Ottawa. They were moving the puck much quicker. They were more aggressive. Um, you wonder how much of an impact Alex Burroughs had on that. Uh, we asked Brendan Gallagher after the game, and you know, Burroughs came in as a new assistant coach, uh, promoted from Laval. Laval had, his, all, had a good power play with him there. Uh, fresh voice. Uh, fresh ideas. All the guys have talked about how energetic and enthusiastic Burroughs is. He only retired as a player three years ago. He's, he's in touch with today's modern day player. He has some modern day ideas. I mean, power play was struggling for so many years under Kirk Muller. Uh, just a fresh voice and fresh ideas. And uh, it really seemed to work. I mean, Kirk Kimiemi looked really good on the power play, the way he was passing the puck and finding guys and, and uh, just a, a confidence, I guess. We'll see if they can carry it over. I mean, this power play has been a problem for an extended period of time. A uh, new coach coming into a little bit of a boost, but it's going to be interesting to see if they can continue this under Alex Burroughs. But an impressive start for Burroughs as an assistant coach. Yeah, definitely. They have to be able to continue this in order to say if it's going to be a success. But also because the power play was just so bad, there's only way, only one way to go is up. And it would just take a little bit of time for Alex Burroughs to, to get his message across. And it seems like the message is getting across after the game against the Ottawa Senators. And uh, Stu, you said it, that he's a new age coach. Uh, new ideas, new way of communicating, and it seems to have really worked out so far uh, with the Montreal Canadiens and the plan to bring him in looks to be the right move, but now it's consistently. Let's see if the Canadians are able to constantly do this and then we can say if it's successful or not. Yeah, and Don Ducharme has spoken. Like, he wants the players to play aggressive. Like, he wants, you know, create two-on-ones all over the ice, and that's carried over to the special teams. You know, their, their PK was sitting back and just letting teams move around. There wasn't any aggressive aggressiveness there that aggressiveness this aggressiveness geez i can say that is there on both the pb <laughs> and the pk now uh and so it's it's a combination i guess of, of ducharme and and burroughs bringing in pushing that aggressiveness and having the guys be aggressive on both special teams and, and i noticed their power play had a lot more movement with you know the interchange of players uh not not basically standing in in one area they're they're moving all around trying to uh you know, get opposition's box kind of uh, out of sorts. And I think that uh, that causes a little bit of uh, confusion. And, of course, the bottom line is, you know, uh, capitalizing when they have the chances. And, you know, on the uh, other side, their penalty killing uh, was effective because of uh, the way that they attacked the opposition up ice. They, they made a lot of uh, – created a lot of problems with, the, uh, with Ottawa trying to uh, – to generate anything uh, under control and they have the speed and they have the type of uh, personnel that uh, they can be very effective if they don't allow the opposition to get set up the way they like to so we, you know you, you uh, everybody was was critical of those uh, 
those two special teams, but you have to give them credit that they did make strides and they did get the uh, results, which is the bottom line. Well, even if it was just one game, you have to say the special teams looking pretty good against the Ottawa Senators. Let's move on to question number two. I, I mentioned off top all of the different good things that happened for the Montreal Canadiens against the Ottawa Senators. And uh, not only did it come after the game, but it came after the post-game media availability of the Montreal Canadiens relief, Stefan Waite, the goaltending coach of his duties. He had been with the team since 2013. And now Sean Burke will take over as the director of goaltending. So not just the goaltending coach, but the director of goaltending. Uh, panelists, how surprised were you upon hearing the news that Stefan Waite had been relieved of his duties? I would have to say I was very surprised by it because it came about an hour after the game was over that they made that announcement. So it was around almost 11 o'clock at night. But if this was a change that Mark Bergevin was thinking to make, why not make it Sunday when they returned home from the road trip and have that? Now, of course, we're living in uh, the world of COVID-19, so it's going to take Sean Burke two weeks before he's able to join the team. So they're bringing up the goalie coach from the Laval Rocket. So for two weeks, it's kind of like having a substitute teacher there watching uh, Carey Price and Jake Allen trying to get them ready for their games. I just find it's an interesting move that uh, Mark Bergevin decided to make. I don't know if he's starting to panic, if you think this is the third coach that he's let go in six days. Uh, but I just find the timing of this is just very odd. And uh, it will be interesting to see if we get a chance to hear from Mark Bergevin to get an explanation as to why he felt this was the right move to make. Well, you know that TV show Survivor? That's what the <laughs> Habs are, Survivor Island. And uh, if I'm Luke Richardson, I'm nervous that I'm going to be the next guy voted off as uh, – you know, Oof. Keep looking for scapegoats this team. You know, it's uh, Coach Julian's fault. It was Max Pacioretty's fault. It was P.K. Subban's fault. Uh, now it's Stefan Waite's fault. The decision was very bizarre, to put it mildly. Like, if Carey Price had played really poorly against the Senators, you could maybe see them announcing it after the game. But, one, why would you want to take the shine or the spotlight off Dominic Ducharme's first NHL win? What was the rush? Like, why not wait till the next morning? announce it like they did with Claude Julien inspiring and announce it around 10 o'clock in the morning and say Mark Bergeron is going to speak with the media an hour later. I just don't understand what the rush was. A tweet at like 11 o'clock at night, like really? Uh, it's it's just, it's bizarre in, in so many ways. And, you know, Jake Allen, like how is this going to impact Jake Allen? He's played great under Stefan Waite. You know, when you have two goalies under the same coach, goalie coach, and one's playing great and one's not playing great, it's probably not the goalie coach's fault. But Survivor Island, latest scapegoat, Stefan Waite, get off the island. Well, and it's an inter interesting uh, situation at this point that they they make a move like this. Uh, obviously, there must be more to it than we really know about, whether or not the relationship between Kerry and Stefan uh, started to get questionable or, you know, just where that was uh, as far as uh, confidence level goes in the relationship between those two. And, you know, uh, the, the old story is the, the players will win that one. I know Stefan uh, was probably trying and grabbing at every possible thing that he could to try and get things uh, corrected. But, uh, you know, Carrie, uh, Carrie is, a, is basically the one that uh, was uh, in charge when it came to on ice performance. And right now, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's having his, uh, his tough time, but, you know, hopefully he's going to uh, get that thing straightened out so that he can be consistently, uh, one of the, the goalies that he's supposed to be. Well, and it's just because he had a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with Stefan Waite this week leading up to this game. So the way Carey Price played against the Ottawa Senators, it looked like that one-on-one -on -one time with the goalie coach really paid off. But uh, clearly that's not the case since they decided to part ways. Yeah, and on Tuesday morning when we asked Ducharme about putting Price in net instead of Allen, and he said he was confident because of the work he had done, Price had done with Stefan Waite. Um, it's, it's bizarre, and it's another example of how Carey Price has become bigger than the team with that contract he has, uh, full no-movement clause. He's not going anywhere unless he wants to go anywhere. Uh, they need him to play better, and you can't, like, you know, they can't sit him on the bench. They've shown that they're not willing to sit him on the bench for an extended period. They're going to play him. So it's all about Carey Price. This team is all about Carey Price right now. He's the guy with that contract, and he's, you know, they used, there was criticism years ago that P.K. Subban was bigger than the team, but I think Carey Price is bigger than the team right now in a bigger way than P.K. Subban ever was. 
Um, I want to just focus a bit on, on Carey Price after the game. One comment in particular, uh, when he was asked about the, some of the different things he was working on, uh, I think with Stefan Wade, I think that question was directed with Stefan Wade in, in mind. Uh, what was he working on? And he straight up said, like, stopping pucks. It kind of said it Jess before he went on with his answer. But I'm also just kind of curious, uh, Jess, like, what did you think of that particular comment? Well, I don't know. It's it's Carey Price. He's a man of few words. Uh, it's hard to kind of read into how he feels. Uh, but it was kind of a longer press conference from Carey Price that we're used to, you know, especially working in radio. I can't really play a three second clip, but he, I was able to get, you know, some 12 uh, second clips from him. He seemed pretty happy about it. Was he happy because that he won the game and kind of got the critics off his back by his performance? Or was he happy that Mark Bergman told him, you know what, we've let Stefan know that he's no longer going to be your goalie coach and we've got uh, Sean Burke coming in 14 days? Yeah, but I mean, Price seemed in a good mood in that uh, Zoom conference, much different than the Price we saw the previous game afterwards. Uh, you know, it was a typical Carey Price answer. I mean, after the previous game, uh, he said, oh, it's in my head, that's all I got for you. I mean, he doesn't you know, he doesn't like talking with the media. He doesn't hide the fact he doesn't like talking with the media. It was a Carey Price answer. But again, this whole thing is just, it's just so bizarre. And the way the Canadians handled it, I really don't think they helped those at all. Like, I just like, what was the rush? What was the rush? Uh, you know, when I, uh, somebody texted me actually the tweet from the Canadians while I was writing my post game story. And at first I thought it was one of those fake Twitter accounts. I said, oh, that can't be good. So I actually went to the Canadians official account to make sure that it was in fact true. And it was. Yeah. Well, again, a question of finger pointing and, you know, uh, Stefan was probably, uh, spending uh, obviously a lot of time and, and restless nights trying to figure out how we can get, you know, carry back to where he was before. And, uh, as we all know, the bottom line is the goaltender has to perform. And, uh, you know, just judging from what I've seen as of late with Kerry, obviously confidence is uh, is shaken. But I do see a lot of uh, situations where basically he gets himself down on the ice uh, really early. And, uh, you know, I don't know if it's uh, a question of uh, whether it's what's being taught or just his reaction. But, Every uh, uh, other team that plays against him is, is looking at shooting up high over the shoulder or obviously on the stick side between the pad and the uh, and the blocker. And uh, I don't know. It's a tough position. The technical stuff is, is really uh, difficult to fine tune and consistently get it right. You're just hoping that the overall skill and talent, which is really what takes over in that position, uh, will get itself corrected sooner than later. Yeah, the other thing. Marciano. Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. Tom Burke's got a two-week quarantine now, so Price basically has no goalie coach for two weeks. I mean, the guy coming in from Laval. Good luck to him. You know, just trying to get Carey Price to listen to him coming from a you know an AHL goalie coach. But it's again, it's just I don't. What was the rush? Marco Marciano happens to be the name of the uh, AHL goalie coach who will be uh, working with Carey Price until Sean Burke comes in. And once Sean Burke is in, I believe officially he will be Carey Price's fourth goalie coach uh, since joining the organization. Let's talk about shootouts and overtimes. That's something the Montreal Canadiens are not good in. The Canadiens, in fact, have not won in overtime or in a shootout this year. They are a combined 0-5 in, in both of those uh, times of play. Uh, fans are even angry about who starts uh, for the Montreal Canadiens in the overtime period. I'm sure you have all seen some of the angry comments about Philip Deneau starting in overtime against the Winnipeg Jets over the weekend. Uh, why do the Montreal Canadiens struggle so much in overtime and shootouts? Well, for, for me, I think you have to look at your personnel and, and how you use them. I mean, are you playing to, uh, to get into the shootout? Are you playing to keep it, you know, uh, close or are you playing to win and you put your, your best guys out there for me and uh, you let those guys uh, dangle and, you know, I don't see that happening with the, the personnel that they have and the skill sets of some of those guys that are sitting on the bench in the three on three uh, situations are uh, doing more watching than playing. And I, I don't know, I'm a, a big believer. I, I know one thing for sure. I would not be on the ice on the three on three situation. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, looking at uh, their depth pool, they have some guys that it's three on three. Where it's just you, you just let it rip up and down the ice you go. You can skate and uh, be creative and you go with your top guns 
and you just you you run with them, and uh, you don't forget about trying to play defense because it's just it's all about going for it. And uh, I don't see them necessarily, uh, you know, having that type of a mindset and in, uh, in the way that some of the players are being used. Well, Rick loves to say, "Never trust the forward. Trust the forward in overtime." Like, <laughs> Dominic Ducharme's explanation for the, putting Dano out was that he want it was all based on winning the faceoff, which is like a 50-50 flip a coin thing anyway. Like it just it made no sense. And with Yol Armia, I mean, I understand Petrie on the ice. He skates like a forward. He's you know, one of their best offensive players. But those other two guys, you know, three on three is a crapshoot. Put your best three players out there, whether they're three forwards or just put your best three offensive players out there and see what happens. I mean, I don't think there's a whole lot of strategy in three on three. It's it's shinny hockey, right? And and you know, you come down the ice, you have a great chance at one end, and it's going to go a two on one the other way. So. Put your three best offensive players on the ice. Put three guys who can really skate and see what happens. I mean, if you're going to flip a coin on a, uh, winning a face-off, you might as well flip a coin putting your best three players out there because I think that's a much better odds of, of winning. And, uh, you know, it's, these are important points that they're losing. You know, five games that have gone to overtime or shoot and they've lost them all. That's five points right there. That could be the difference. between and, and the Winnipeg Jets put their three best players out there, three forwards. You know, Dano loses the faceoff, puck goes on the ace, goal of game over. I'm going to borrow a line from Carey Price here. I think they're overthinking it. You know, that, like you said, this is supposed to be the most exciting part of hockey. Let the, you know, offensive talented players go out there and try and do something. And I think that's something that they've been a little bit hesitant to do. It might also be the fact that they've been on this five game winless streak and maybe there's more pressure on them and they're putting more pressure to get something done in order to win this game. And unfortunately it ends up backfiring with them and they can't get it done. And uh, like you said, these are huge points that they're leaving out there and it just kind of doesn't make sense. Their strategy that they're using right now, that they're playing a more conservative way when they're going into the overtime period, which should not be the case. Put the guys out there, the guys who can score the goal, not the defensively minded guys. I think you're right, Jess. I mean, the overthinking, like if you're coaching a team at the Quebec Pee Wee tournament in overtime, you put your best three kids on the ice. I think in, you know, it's hard to start to compare a Pee Wee tournament to the NHL, but just put your best three players on the ice. And after that, put your next best three players on the ice. Uh, and one of them can score. And it all comes down to, you know, puck possession. Uh, you know, you, you go for it. And uh, as we've seen in, in, with the Canadians and other teams, there's a lot of times that the, the guys get caught out there tired, right? And end up crossing them. So they have to be a little more intelligent in, in their uh, in their ways of changing. But I say, you know, go for it. Uh, it's no secret. It's a man-on-man -man situation. Uh, communication amongst the three that will allow you to, you know, make the right decisions on the defensive side. But, uh, you know, go for it and uh, don't get caught out there tired and try and make smart smart changes, and I think that should help them. Do you guys have thoughts on who, you know, if you guys happen to be head coach, I mean, Rick, I know Rick has the experience he has being behind the bench, but if you're in a situation where you have to put the best players on the ice to start overtime for the Montreal Canadiens, any ideas that come to mind? The first thing that comes to mind for me, why not put the uh, suzuki Joy anderson line out there? They show a lot of speed. They show a lot of skill. They show a lot of talent. Why not do that? Why not have a Suzuki Drew and Petrie situation? Hey, here's an idea. Have Alexander Romanov even on the ice as well. He's shown to be pretty good when he's on the ice as well. Any ideas from you all? No, that, that makes total sense. I mean, putting Philip Leno, who hasn't scored a goal in a calendar year, makes no sense putting him out there in overtime. Um, no, that, that makes sense. And, and also putting out a forward line makes sense too because they already have that chemistry together. They're used to playing together. Just sort of have one of the guys hang back a bit, the, you know, as I mentioned earlier, Jeff Petrie skates like a forward. I understand him being out there. Uh, but the other guys, like, I, I just don't get it. It makes, it makes sense to what you said, Julie. Like, you put out Petrie maybe as the first wave and Romanov with the second wave. And then, you know, Scotty Bowman, when he coached, used to like to have uh, duos as opposed to trios with his lines. And he'd, so take have duos, forward duos, and put them out with those guys. Or just put the whole forward line out there. Yeah. And I know they don't have a lot of practice time this year because of how the schedule is, but, you know, maybe dedicate more time like that to have those duos go out there that you might not necessarily be playing on a line with them. But when it comes to the overtime, you know that these are the group that will be sent out there. The first, Kind of like with the power play, first unit, you guys go out. Second unit, you guys go out. So maybe it's a little bit more structured in that way. Yeah, and why not, like, uh, 
like we talked about Romanoff and, and Petrie, th these guys can skate and they can create things uh, on the offense. Give, give them the opportunity and then go with your, your big gunners uh, up front that, uh, you know, know how to score. They know how to skate and they know how to be creative. And, um, you know, I think that would be, uh, would be a bonus uh, if they were able to uh, put together a group that, Hey, listen, we go on offense. Let's, let's let it go. And, uh, you know, when it comes down to our defensive zone play, we just basically man on man and, uh, uh, you know, wait for the turnover and then away you go. Let's, uh, let's get that thing straightened out. As far as a shootout, maybe the new goalie coach can help Price because if your goalie lets in two out of three shots in a shootout, you're not going to win too many of them. Oof, Stu with the late shot there. Uh, I'll end with this. It's very funny that Stu said that uh, overtime is a crapshoot. You know who else said oh, three on three overtime is a crapshoot? Uh, Paul Statsny, who actually ended up scoring the overtime winner for the Winnipeg Jets against the Canadians this past weekend. It seems like this debate will persist every time the Montreal Canadiens and the Ottawa Senators will play against each other. Yasperi Kotkaniemi versus Brady Kachuk. They were in the same draft class. The Montreal Canadiens opted to take Yasperi Kotkaniemi. The Ottawa Senators ended up taking Brady Kachuk. Yasperi Kotkaniemi still trying to do his thing, still trying to you know, arise to the expectations that have been set by him while Brady Kachuk continues to run rampant in the North Division, in particular against the Montreal Canadiens. Panelists, I ask you this question, and I won't be surprised if uh, on a future episode we have to deal with this again. Did the Montreal Canadiens make a mistake when they drafted Jesperi Kakanyemi ahead of Brady Kachuk? You know what? I'm not ready to say that it's been a mistake. It's still too early on when Jesperi Kakanyemi's career and with Brady Kachuk as well. You know, you don't know what the future might hold for them. And sometimes I think it's a little bit easier to focus on the here and now rather than kind of look down the line. But you look at the way Jesperi Kakanyemi played against the Ottawa Senators. He had a great game. And uh, he's kind of more, I think, the player that the Montreal Canadiens were necessarily looking for and they're hoping to develop. And if he can continue to do that way, I think it'd be good. But I find it's just always so hard when you try and compare and see who won when it comes to, you know, either a trade or a draft if they made the right choice because uh, you just don't know. And because they're young players, I'm not ready to say that this was a mistake by the Montreal Canadiens. Go ahead, Rick. Uh, it, it's always easy to second guess, right? I, I should have, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a crapshoot. I don't, I don't necessarily feel that, uh, uh, you know, they lost out totally with taking Kokinemi. I mean, he's, he was picked. They needed him. Uh, they needed help at center. He's, uh, he's a kind of kid that maybe takes a little more time to, uh, to uh, understand how to play at a high level and at the NHL. I mean, yes, to has got nine goals. Uh, you know, he brings a different ingredient in the way that he plays. Uh, but Kakinami, uh, again, might be a, a slow developer. He does have the, the ability, if you will, to, uh, to, to get better. And we're, I, I'm quite sure the organization is hoping that, you know, that he's going to continue on the, uh, on the good track in improving in a lot of areas. And, you know, most importantly, being able to be the sentiment that they, uh, they needed and uh, we're missing over uh, the last number of years. Yeah, normally, you know, the, the Canadians' philosophy going into a draft is take the best player available regardless of the position. Uh, that goes back to when they took Carey Price. I mean, Carey, you know, people are like, what are they doing drafting a goalie? Jose Theodore had been, won the Vezina Trophy not that long before, but it was, you know, they thought Price was the best player available regardless of position, and they took him. But with Kakinyemi, that wasn't the case. Uh, they needed a center, and uh, if Kakinyemi was in the center, they wouldn't have drafted him, and I'm pretty sure they would have taken Kachuk or somebody else. Brady Kachuk is, I was going to say, will be an impact player in the NHL, but he's already an impact player in the NHL. He does it all. He's a power forward. He can score. He's a pass to play against. He can fight, as Ben Schrott found out. Mm -hmm. uh, he, you know, he's, he's, he's plays on that edge. Uh, you know, he, he's an impact player. I don't know if Kakanyemi is ever going to be that type of impact player. As just said, it's too early. He's only 20 years old. He's obviously got skill. Uh, you know, we'll see going forward uh, if he can become the Canadiens' number one center. Uh, it'll be between him and Suzuki, obviously, for that position moving forward. Uh, but I think the better player at that time was Kachuk, and I think the better player right now is Kachuk. Uh, so it's going to be up to Kutkanyemi to prove to the Canadians that they made the right choice uh, moving forward. Uh, again, he's only 20 years old. Uh, he's had a bumpy ride, been sent down to Laval last year, had some injuries. Uh, so we'll see. 
And it was interesting that, you know, the, the, the game that Karkinemi played last night, I don't know whether or not it was to hush or a few of the critics that have spoken against him, but he seemed to be motivated and driven to say, you know what, I'm going to be the better player. Uh, you're not going to draw any more comparisons uh, to, uh, to, 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 to Chuck. He's <laughs> Chuck. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I put my teeth back in. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's what it is. And uh, Chuck and Emmy, uh, listen, I hope he, he, he continues to, uh, to pick up where he, he left off from last night's game because uh, it was one of his better games. And I hope for the kid. Rick, I'm with you. There's way too many Ks between these two players. Anyway, let's get to question five. Uh, Jeff Petrie, we've praised him a lot on the show. He's played really well this year. I, I think of him as a dark horse for the Norris Trophy. Maybe not even a dark horse. He might have a legitimate chance. Uh, in fact, this week, uh, six years ago, the Montreal Canadiens acquired Jeff Petrie in a trade from the Edmonton Oilers in exchange for two draft picks. Uh, even if he doesn't play on the top pairing, do you see Jeff Petrie as the team's number one defenseman? Well, you have to give him full marks. He's leading the team with points, uh, you know, plus minus if you want, uh, at plus 11. Uh, he, he does it all. I, I know his game, uh, like the team, struggled uh, as of late, but he he's the kind of player that uh, when he's on, he's obviously very, very effective on both power play and penalty killing, a big guy. And we've talked about him before as – uh, a, a kind of player that can do it all. And uh, I don't know, maybe his confidence got uh, rattled a little bit like a lot of other guys. And uh, I'm hoping that he'll, you know, he'll find a way to get that confidence level back so that he can continue to contribute the way he contributes offensively and defense, defensively because he is a really big asset to the, uh, to the defensive core. And uh, from what I understand, a real good person that uh, uh, you can never have too many guys like that. I think it's a situation where it's 1A and 1B when it comes to their defense, of course, with Shea Weber, uh, that Jeff Petrie really does also have that kind of leadership role in the room, especially with some of the younger defensemen. And he's been off to a good start to the season. There was kind of a bumpy road. I wonder, too, could it be injury? Could it be a confidence issue or a combination of the team just not doing well? Uh, but Jeff Petrie is definitely a huge factor when it comes uh, to their defensive core. And I think that, uh, you know, it's kind of like that interchangeable position between him and Shea Weber. Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt who the best defenseman is on the Canadians. It's, it's Petrie. Nobody, it's not even close. Uh, you know, Claude Julien, before he was fired, as Jess mentioned, even talked about, you know, the two pairings, Weber and Sherratt and Edmondson and Petrie are like 1A, 1B. Or they go out against whoever. And if you look at the defenseman's ice time each game, it rotates over who had the most ice time. Uh, the game against Ottawa, Edmondson had the most ice time. You know, he played really well with Petrie. So, you know, Petrie's the best defenseman on this team. There's no doubt about it. I mean, he does it all, right? He's physical, uh, offense, uh, uh, you know, he's at 20 points already, uh, can skate, can do, he does He does everything. Um, and he's, he's their top guy. I don't think there's any doubt about that right now. So uh, let, Let's not forget Edmondson uh, as being a, a real asset to uh, allowing Petrie to do what he does. I mean, well, I've talked about the chemistry of uh, defensive parries and how it's so critical in, you know, in making things happen in a positive way. And uh, those two guys seem to uh, uh, do it well together and it, it allows, uh, you know, Petrie to, uh, to do his thing offensively and uh, knowing very well he has good backup with his partner and they, they seem to see eye to eye, which is uh, nothing but a bonus for defensive pairings. Rick Edmondson reminds you a bit of you. Do you see some of yourself in him? Yeah, actually, uh, you know, trying to, other than his plus minus, which. But he's your classic player of just keep it simple, play within your limitations, uh, use, use them in critical uh, areas, uh, you know, to protect the lead, to play against some of the. Uh, the, the better offensive guys and just find a way to keep your game consistent so you're very dependable and uh, don't make many mistakes out there. And obviously he's really, really good at that. And, you know, like I said, he compliments uh, Petrie very much. So he is the modern Rick Green. <laughs> Rick, I promise you, uh, if we calculated plus minus for this show, you would be in the pluses and not the minuses. I promise you that. 
Uh, that'll do it for this that'll do it for this week's episode of hockey inside out if you have a question you'd like to see our panelists tackle please add it in the comment section below and visit hockeyinsideout.com to check out our full episode